concludes general questions. We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlow. Uh, presiding officer, just before recess, I tackled the First Minister about the subject choice crisis in Scotland schools, and her response was one of denial. Yet this week, Reform Scotland published a report spelling out that previously, most pupils could, stud most pupils could study up to eight subjects at S4. Now under Curriculum for Excellence, in most cases, that is only six. Does the First Minister still refuse to accept that this is a problem? First Minister. Um, I've read the Reform Scotland study that was published this week. Um, it looks, as much of the work on this topic does, it looks at S4. As Jackson Carlaw knows, uh, the senior phase in school doesn't just consist of S4, it lasts for three years. And what matters is the qualifications and awards that pupils leave school with, not just those that they study at S4. And what we see is the percentage of pupils getting qualifications at level five or above is up. The percentage leaving with hires is up. Uh, back in 2009, uh, the percentage of pupils getting five hires or more was 22%. Last year, that was more than 30%. We see the attainment gap between rich and poor and hires at an all-time low. We see a record number of school leavers now in higher education. We see school leavers from the most deprived areas in higher education up eight percentage points since a decade ago. So on the day that uh, school pupils across the country start sitting their exams, I think we should be paying tribute to the excellent work that they're doing. Jackson Carla. First Minister, what also matters is the breadth as well as the depth of education and the choices available to pupils. Yesterday, the Education Committee were told that the problem is curriculum for excellence. Guidance was issued. It proved so confusing that in 2016 it was reissued, but it's still a mess. So it now seems like that the Scottish Government will have to redraft it yet again. Third time lucky, perhaps. But with witnesses to the committee, Education Committee saying yesterday, that a mid-term review as recommended back in 2015 was necessary, then noted that Education Scotland has, and I quote, other priorities and that they're getting round to it. First Minister, doesn't that just sum up this government? First Minister. Education Scotland uh, is working on reducing bureaucracy, tackling unnecessary workload for teachers, something that I think Jackson Carlow has asked us to do uh, exactly. in the past. So Education Scotland uh, getting on with the job. Jackson Carlaw is to some extent right here when he says it's about the choices young people have and the breadth of education. Uh, that's uh, all that Curriculum for Excellence, that of course is what Curriculum for Excellence is designed to do, but it's about choice and breadth across the entirety of the senior phase, not in one year of the senior phase alone. And the problem with Jackson Carlaw's analysis here is that the outcomes from education that we are seeing, which I've just cited to the Chamber, do not bear that out. We see uh, more young people leaving school with qualifications. The numbers leaving school with five hires or more has gone up. And we actually now see record numbers in higher education, including record numbers from deprived areas. Uh, so I will be the first to concede that we've got more work to do. That's why we're getting on to do it. But the evidence that I've just read out it says that young people in our schools, in our education system, are performing well, exactly. and they and their teachers should be congratulated exactly. for it. Jackson Carlow. First, first Minister, the evidence suggests you're not the first to concede it, you're the last to concede it. At S4 is precisely the stage when pupils should have the opportunity to experience the broadest range of subjects to take forward. We were once famed around the world for our breadth of education. Now curriculum for excellence is narrowing horizons. But it gets worse because yesterday we learned curriculum for excellence is so confusing and with too few teachers, pupils at different levels are being taught together not just at National 4 and 5, but at higher 2. So in consequence, a 14-year-old and even an 18-year-old, a 14-year-old and even an 18-year-old could be being taught in the same classroom. I don't think that is appropriate, does the First Minister? First Minister. Again, the problem with Jackson Carlow's analysis on these issues is that the results that are coming from Scottish education do not bear out exactly. the criticisms that he's making. Now, I know he doesn't like the evidence. He talks about the breadth of education. Because of Curriculum for Excellence, of course, young people now get a broad general education right up until S3. They then have three years of the senior phase uh, where they can study a range of different subjects. And again, I'll go back to the evidence. 
If what Jackson Carlaw was saying was correct, then we would not have a situation today where there is a greater proportion of pupils leaving school with qualifications than ever before, uh, level fives and hires. We wouldn't have a situation where the proportion of young people leaving school with five hires or more has actually gone up significantly yeah. over the past number of years. And we wouldn't have a situation where there are a record number of young people going into positive destinations, including record numbers going into higher education. So those are the results of our education system. And they simply do not bear out the analysis uh, that Jackson Carlaw is bringing to this chamber. Those are the facts. Jackson Carlaw. I mean, incredibly, the First Minister's position seems to be that an increase in qualifications by pupils can only be achieved if you narrow the actual options that are available to them for study. <laughs> Presiding officer, curriculum for excellence is only a few years old, so we're only starting to see its impact. All of us here want to see the improvement of schools as our number one priority. But we can't just ignore the evidence this week from Professor Jim Scott, a head teacher with 18 years experience, who said we are in danger of a whole generation going past who have not had a good experience in education. Despite the best efforts, despite the best efforts of our teachers, despite the hard work of our pupils, a whole generation let down on her watch. Can the First Minister not see this? Can the First Minister not see this for the failure of her government that it is? First Minister. As we debate these things in this chamber today, there are young people across uh, Scotland uh, sitting their exams. And I think to talk down their achievements Absolutely. in the way that Jackson Carlow just has is an absolute disgrace. We have a situation where there is a broader, there are more vocational awards that young people can sit right now to make sure they have the skills they need uh, for the workplace. And again, you know, Jackson Carlow, I note that he hasn't, uh, he hasn't taken on any of the facts that I have yeah. cited yeah. to him. Yeah. More yeah. young people leaving school with qualifications. Yeah. He says, oh yeah, but that's about a narrowing. And then I point to the fact that there are more young people leaving school with five or more yeah. hires. Yeah. Now, exactly. why can't Jackson exactly. Carlow accept that that is an achievement of our young people, their parents and their teachers. We will continue to work to improve Scottish education, but as we do so, we will pay tribute to the great work teachers and pupils are already doing across the country. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, this morning it has been reported that the number of emergency food parcels handed out by food banks in Scotland over the last year has risen again. The shocking fact is that more and more children in Scotland are growing up in poverty. The Scottish Government has said that it does not plan to introduce an income supplement to help the poorest families in Scotland until 2022, but wants another independence referendum before 2021. First Minister, what does that say about your priorities? First Minister. What it says. What it says about my priorities is I want the powers in this parliament to tackle child poverty. I'm not sure. I am not sure what it says about Richard Leonard's priorities that he wants to leave those powers in the hands of the Conservatives. Now, let me turn. First Minister, okay. First Minister, can I just ask everybody please to keep the noise down? We were just talking a few minutes ago about the lessons that young people might learn. Can you please set an example to those young people? First Minister. On the income supplement, we will bring forward uh, our plans in June, uh, and I'm sure Parliament will scrutinise those carefully. But let's look at the Trussell Trust report uh, this morning. The rise in food bank use is utterly unacceptable. But let's look at what the Trust's uh, operations manager in Scotland says about it. Uh, the benefit system is supposed to protect us all from being swept into poverty. Universal credit should be part of the solution. But currently, it's the five-week wait that is leaving many people without enough money to cover the basics. 
as a priority, we are urging the government to end the wait for universal credit. Universal credit is the responsibility of the UK government. So the question for uh, Richard Leonard is, will he join with Labour in Wales this morning? Because what they've said in response to the Trussell uh, Trust uh, report is not that it's the, the fault of the Labour government in Wales. What they've said is the problem is universal credit and that's what's going, got to change. Will Richard Leonard agree with that now? <laughs> Richard Leonard. Of course, a lot of this lies at the door of the Tory government. But you've got the, but you've got the powers. But can, we, but can we just clarify? Can we just clarify what the First Minister has just said? She said that she will bring forward proposals in June. But this government has no plans to implement them for another three years. If the First Minister tells us today that she will fast-track those plans, she will have the support of the Scottish Labour Party. Because in the end, this is all about priorities. For Richard, example, Mr Leonard, sorry. Would Derek Mackay and Colin Smith please stop talking to each other across the aisle? <laughs> and other members similarly. Richard Leonard. This is a matter of priorities. So, for example, we think that this government should spend the 0.1% of the Scottish budget needed to protect families from the impact of the two-child cap. But over the recess, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security said, and I quote, it is not our policy to alleviate the cap. So can the First Minister explain why that is the choice that she is making? First Minister. The United Nations sent Philip Alston, an expert in poverty here last year, to write a report um, he recognised the work of the Welsh Government to mitigate the worst impacts of austerity, but he said, and I'm quoting him directly, that it is outrageous that devolved administrations need to spend resources to shield people from government policies. He is right. Those are the words of Jeremy Corbyn. Now, this government, this government has mitigated uh, the impact of Tory welfare cuts uh, wherever we can. But is Richard Leonard really standing here and saying that the answer to these cuts is for a devolved government to take money out of devolved services uh, to plug the gaps in reserved services while a Westminster government holds on to that money? That is surely not the proposition of Scottish Labour. So I've given him uh, this opportunity before. If he, likes, like me, really wants to tackle these issues, will he this afternoon join with me in a letter to the UK government asking for full power over welfare to be devolved to this parliament. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Richard Leonard. Well given, well, given your track record, you would probably hand those powers back. First Minister, you do have the powers to protect families from the cap. And you do have the powers to fast track an income supplement, but you choose not to use them. Exactly. You choose instead to talk about the constitution, you choose to play to your party base, you choose to argue for a referendum that Scotland does not want. In fact, since you became First Minister, you have pledged to call another independence referendum twice. And in that time, at least three quarters of a million food parcels have been handed out to families in Scotland. So First Minister, isn't it the case when it comes to a choice between protecting the poor and protecting your party, you always put your party first. First Minister. Well, I have to say this. If Richard Leonard cannot see the relationship between the Constitution, the powers we have in this Parliament, and Tory welfare cuts that are pushing children into poverty, then Richard Leonard doesn't deserve ever to be in government in Scotland. So we will continue to do everything we can to mitigate the impact of these policies. We will bring forward policies of our own to lift children out of poverty. But unlike Richard Leonard and the Labour Party, we will argue for those powers to lie in this parliament, not in the hands of the Tories. And as long as Richard Leonard on the Constitution continues to back the Tories, then the people of Scotland will yes. see him for exactly what he is. We have some constituency supplementaries. The first from Annabel Ewing. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the latest unplanned flaring incident at Musmorin. My constituents have had to put up with hugely disturbing noise pollution since Sunday and are rightly anxious about air quality. Surely all data held by SEPA and ExxonMobil on the composition of these emissions should now be published. And is it not high time that SEPA use their enforcement powers to the fullest? Well, can I thank Annabelle Ewing for raising this issue? I am uh, well aware and understand the concerns that are raised by the local community following the unplanned flaring at the most modern complex uh, in Fife. SEPA's air quality monitoring does continue to show uh, that there isn't a cause for concern. That said, I do appreciate that noise and light pollution is a significant, a very significant issue for local residents. Um, I understand that SEPA announced a formal investigation into the current flaring incident this morning. A range of enforcement powers are at its disposal, which it, of course, exercises independently of government. Uh, I am very clear, however, that the company must take steps to minimise the frequency and adverse impacts of flaring on the local community. Uh, SEPA has advised us that they will publish air quality monitoring data on the dedicated Ms Morin online, online hub later today and additionally the Ms Morin and Brayfoot Bay Independent Air Quality Monitoring Review Group uh, will also publish air quality data annually. Jamie Halker johnson to be followed by John Mason. Thank you. The First Minister will be aware of the huge wildfires that have been burning across parts of my region, the Highlands and Islands, over the last few days, most notably in Murray, where large areas of grassland have been destroyed. Will she join with me in thanking all those involved in fighting these fires, most notably the fire and other emergency services, but also the many estate workers, farmers and others who have played such a crucial role so far? And can she advise me what support the Scottish Government can offer to those local people whose livelihoods have been impacted? and what will be done to examine the causes of those fires and prevent more from occurring in the future. First Minister. Uh, well, I thank the member for raising an important issue. Uh, we have, as uh, you would expect, been in touch with the Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, Service to offer any additional support uh, as they continue to tackle these fires uh, and uh, as they also look at the, the causes. I understand that uh, the incident in Murray is reducing, uh, as is the case in Skye and Abermurkin, but these continue to be serious incidents and we will continue to liaise closely with the Fire and Rescue Service. John Mason to be followed by Bob Doris. Uh, thank you very much. I think the First Minister is aware of the issue of marches in my constituency and particularly the recent proposed one on Easter Sunday by the Apprentice Boys past uh, a couple of Catholic churches. I wonder if she thinks the present arrangements and legal arrangements are satisfactory or perhaps if Glasgow City Council need more powers in order to reduce or restrict such marches. First Minister. Uh, well, we're also always rather happy to talk to councils about the range of powers at their disposal. Uh, we have faith, I have faith in Police Scotland to ensure the safety of members of the public uh, and indeed those participating in any marches. Uh, Police Scotland works closely with councils to ensure that there are adequate safety measures in place and will take appropriate and proportionate action in the event of any problems arising. I was uh, absolutely appalled, as I'm sure everybody in this chamber was, uh, with the incident that took place outside St Alphonse's Church last year and this is an opportunity for all of us to reiterate that nobody should ever be a target of hatred simply because of their faith and the Scottish Government will always be very clear on that point. Bob Doris. First Minister, I have a large Sri Lankan community in my constituency who have contributed greatly to the communities that I serve. One of my constituents lost two of his relatives and 13 of his friends in the horrific and evil terror attacks in Sri Lanka. They are grieving at this hugely difficult time. I will be meeting community members shortly to discuss how we can commemorate their loved ones and to show our solidarity. Glasgow's Lord Provost has indicated her support also. Will the First Minister back these efforts and ensure that she or a member of the Scottish Government attend such an occasion to show their support and solidarity with those who have lost their loved ones? First Minister. Well, can I thank Bob Doris for raising this issue on behalf of his constituents uh, and I want to again as I did yesterday express my deepest condolences to all those affected uh, and also to express my wholehearted support for any efforts to commemorate uh, those who have lost their lives and to show solidarity with the Sri Lankan community here in Scotland and indeed around the world uh, and the Scottish Government will be uh, very uh, keen to take part in uh, any uh, events that are held. Uh, we've all been really shocked and saddened by these attacks. Uh, I have written to the Prime Minister and the President of 
of Sri Lanka on behalf of the people of Scotland to express our sincere condolences. Um, I welcome Bob Doris's efforts to reach out to the Sri Lankan community here at uh, this desperately sad time and I hope he will convey to them uh, my support, solidarity and condolences. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. I'm quite sure the entire chamber will join the First Minister in those last uh, remarks. Presiding officer, it's a shame that no one else has yet welcomed yesterday's very positive announcement about putting Scotland's future back into Scotland's hands, because, because it's clear that UK politics is broken and the UK government has shown contempt for Scotland. So Greens agree that change is needed and we continue to take the view that independence offers the chance of the new direction that this country badly needs. In that campaign, we'll advocate for the Green New Deal which we proposed in Parliament yesterday and which the government voted for to tackle the climate crisis and inequality together. But isn't it also clear that neither devolution nor a currency union nor the business as usual vision set out in the SNP's growth commission would permit the genuine economic independence that we need to make that transformational agenda possible. Why should we close off the possibilities that independence offers now of all times? First Minister. Oh, no, I don't agree with that at all, although I certainly welcome Patrick Harvey's comments about uh, my statement yesterday and support for independence. Um, I think it's healthy that there are a range of parties uh, backing independence, putting forward a range of views. The essence of independence is we decide these issues for ourselves. And uh, my party conference, as uh, some have noticed, will meet at the weekend uh, and we'll have a very positive debate about how independence will allow us to emulate the success of other small independent countries and become more prosperous and fairer as a result. And I think the big question, uh, particularly for uh, the unionist parties in this chamber is this, given uh, in particular the price that Scotland is paying right now for being governed by Westminster, why shouldn't Scotland be independent? Uh, independence is normal. You know, 12 of the countries in the EU that have more influence over our future right now than we do are the same size or smaller than Scotland. Nobody is going to force them out of the EU against their will and nobody should force Scotland out of the EU against our will. The sooner Scotland is an equal, normal, independent country, the better for all of us. Patrick Harvey. This does need to be a clear contrast with the failed UK agenda. They're brutal austerity economics, but they've also banned onshore wind, scrapped warm home subsidies, solar subsidies, uh, sold off the Green Investment Bank, forced fracking onto local communities and refused to meet the climate strikers. Scotland can and wants to do better. Without independence, we have one hand tied behind our backs. Under the Growth Commission, we'd have the other hand tied instead, gaining political independence, but without the real economic control that we need. People who were open but not convinced in 2014 are far more likely to back independence if it's based on a positive, bold vision for Scotland's future. So will the First Minister accept that what the Growth Commission offers is closer to the failed economics of the UK and that the Scottish Green plans for a Green New Deal offer the alternative that we need, the foundation of a bold new vision for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, well, I don't agree with Patrick Harvey's comments about the Growth Commission. What it sets out is the fact that so many small independent countries are richer uh, and fairer than Scotland and sets how, how Scotland as an independent country can emulate that, create a strong economy but then crucially use the strength of our economy to build a fairer, uh, more just society. Uh, so that's the positive, bold vision I look forward uh, to campaigning on uh, the next time within this term of Parliament that we give people in Scotland the choice of independence. And I am uh, convinced, more convinced every day, uh, that when given that choice, the people of Scotland will opt to become a normal, independent nation. Question number four, Willie Rennie. This week I have been lobbied by people who want urgent action on climate change. Young climate change activist Greta Thunberg lobbied Westminster SNP leader Ian Blackford too. He boasted about the SNP government's record. Back here, at exactly the same moment, his government was announcing that it was intent on cutting aviation tax to increase air flights to and from Scotland. Is this something to boast about? 
Would Greta be impressed? Minister. Unlike, uh, I think, most other countries, we take account of all aviation emissions yes. uh, in our climate change targets. So, uh, to meet those climate change targets, uh, we have to reduce across all uh, areas of emissions. Uh, but Willie Ray says that we boast about uh, Scotland's performance. Um, if you look at uh, the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, former Executive Secretary, this is what she uh, said just in February. Scotland has already been at the forefront of climate action uh, and this bill, the bill that is currently before uh, Parliament, confirms that status as a world leader. So that's what the world says about yeah, Scotland yeah. on climate be. change. Uh, the chair of the IPCC, who was in Edinburgh uh, just shortly, said, uh, and I'm quoting, he is impressed with the Scottish Government's climate change plan and pleased to see it is based on science. So Scotland is a world leader. Our current plans uh, would see us become carbon neutral by 2050 but we expect I think a week today I'm looking at the environment secretary for confirmation a week today we'll get uh, the updated advice from the committee on climate change and if that advice says that we can go uh, further uh, or faster then we will accept that advice and I think that's something that everybody across this parliament should warmly welcome. Yeah. Willie Rennie. I mean, ju just because she measures it doesn't justify the air tax expansion. I don't think Greta would truly be impressed. When I raised the issue of domestic waste with the First Minister before, she said I was exaggerating. That was before this week's catastrophic report commissioned by the government. It says that inaction from this government means £1 billion will be spent to send Scottish waste to England. That's 87,000 bin lorries sent down the M74. Did she know when our government banned waste to landfill in Scotland, they were just going to dump it in England? Will the First Minister end the planned £250 million tax break for the airline industry and tackle a million tonnes of waste? Or will Greta need to come back? First Minister. Just on a point of fact, uh, and for reasons that uh, Willie Rennie knows, so I won't uh, repeat here, the announcement actually from the Minister this week was that the cut in uh, the air discount tax wasn't going ahead in the coming year, uh, just so that he doesn't inadvertently give people the wrong uh, impression. On waste, we are working with councils to ensure that we are reducing uh, waste that goes to landfill. But whether it's on climate change, reducing emissions, or in any other aspect of environmental action, this government, not uh, by our own estimations, but this government, by the estimations of many across the world, uh, are leading the world. And we should continue to do so. I, I actually think it is right and proper that other parties in this chamber, uh, the pressure groups and activists put greater pressure on us to do more and we will continue to do so because we are determined uh, to continue to be the world leader uh, and take the action that the next generation wants to see. We have some further supplementaries. The first from Anas Sarwar to be followed by Gil Patterson. Anas Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today we welcome officers of the all-party parliamentary group on British Muslims, Baroness Saida Warsi and West Reading MP to the Scottish Parliament. Their landmark Islamophobia Defined Report, which I, as Chair of the CPG on Tackling Islamophobia, and our Secretary, Professor Peter Hopkins, who has 10 years of extensive research on Islamophobia in Scotland, contributed to. That definition has been adopted by hundreds of organisations, academics and communities across the country. While the UK Government continues to dodge and dither on this issue, we have a chance to show leadership here in Scotland. So today I hope that it will be adopted by organisations in Scotland, all Scottish political parties, and crucially by the Scottish Government. Will the First Minister make that commitment today so we can focus not on whether Islamophobia exists, not on what it means and how it manifests itself, but we as policymakers can focus on what we do to challenge and defeat it? First Minister. Thank you with that. I think I think all organisations uh, should sign up to the accepted definition on Islamophobia, uh, as uh, I believe also on uh, the accepted definition of anti-Semitism. Um, and I certainly am happy to update on the Scottish Government's position. I certainly would want to see the Scottish Government do that uh, as well. Um, I would also take the opportunity to welcome uh, members of the All Party Group to uh, the Scottish Parliament today uh, and commend the work that Anna Sarwar, the work that my own colleague Hamza Yusuf uh, has done in tackling Islamophobia. But to say this, that it should not be down 
to the Muslim members of this parliament to lead that fight on their own. Every single one of us should be shoulder to shoulder uh, with every Muslim across our country in tackling Islamophobia. And as First Minister, uh, I am more than prepared to lead from the front in that battle. Gail Patterson to be followed by Monica Lennon. <coughs> Many thanks, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I'm sure you'll be aware of the UNICEF report just published that suggests that a large number of children are not being immunised against measles in the United Kingdom. Is this something that the Scottish Government is considering? And is this having any impact in Scotland? And if so, what action is being taken? First Minister. Uh, the statistics that have been published today by UNICEF are taken from the World Health Organisation analysis of measles and rubella data at a UK level. Uh, I'm pleased to see that childhood immunisation rates across Scotland remain very high and that reflects both the hard work and commitment of our colleagues in the National Health Service and also a recognition of the benefits of vaccination. Um, I think it's worth noting the uptake of the first dose of the MMR vaccine in children up to age five is 96.6%. That continues to exceed the 95% target. However, Gil Patterson is absolutely right to raise this important issue. Uh, we are not complacent, and I want to assure the Chamber that we will continue to make every effort to promote and encourage childhood vaccinations. Monica Lennon to be followed by Rona Mackay. First Minister, this week I lodged my Members' Bill on the provision of free period products. If passed, it will make Scotland a world leader, giving legal underpinning to the provision in schools, colleges and universities, which has already been rolled out, and going further by establishing a universal opt-in system, which would allow anyone in Scotland to access free period products should they need them. I know the First Minister agrees with me that access to period products should be a right and not a privilege. So building on the strong cross-party consensus which exists already, will the First Minister confirm today if she backs my bill and will the Scottish Government enthusiastically get behind the proposals? First Minister. We'll certainly look very carefully at uh, the provisions of the bill. Uh, in terms of what the bill is trying to achieve, I'm 100% uh, behind that. Uh, I would pay tribute to all those who have campaigned on this issue. Um, I would say I think Scotland is already a world leader in tackling period poverty. Uh, we already have free sanitary products available in schools, colleges and universities. We see a growing number uh, of private sector organisations following suit. Uh, and while uh, I think Monica Lennon uh, is to be commended for bringing forward the bill, I don't think we should wait for legislation to encourage all organisations all companies uh, to do what we have already done in government, lead from the front and make sure that uh, no uh, person has to go without sanitary products that they can't afford. Uh, free access should be absolutely the norm everywhere in Scotland. And Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the years since the Parliament unanimously passed the Social Security Bill, what progress has been made in establishing Scotland's newest public service? First Minister. Well, of course, it is a year uh, since the Social Security uh, Bill was uh, passed. Uh, I can tell the Chamber today that in that year, almost £200 million has been paid out to almost 80,000 people across uh, the country. There are carers uh, who have extra money in their pockets because of our carers' allowance supplement. There are low-income families uh, now getting the Best Start grant. I think, uh, and... Uh, the Social Security Minister will correct me if I'm about to get this figure wrong, but I think under in the early days of the Best Start grant, we paid out something like four times the amount of money that had been paid out under uh, the previous uh, system controlled by the Westminster government. So this is a, an amazing success. There is much, much more to do, but I would like to, at this stage, to pay tribute to all those who have worked so hard to create uh, the new Social Security Agency and make sure we've made such a positive start to putting fairness and dignity at the heart of Social Security in Scotland. <laughs> Question number five, Stuart McWhelan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what assistance will be provided to help the mental health of school pupils. First Minister. Our 2018 programme for government set out a £250 million package of measures to support positive mental health and prevent ill health. As part of this, we're committed to the creation of school counsellors in every secondary school with availability to local primary and special schools across the country. To ensure that commitment is met in full by September next year, we're providing around £27 million in the first two years of implementation that will support the delivery and employment of counsellors to ensure that school pupils get the mental health support that they need. Uh, school counselling will enhance the work that schools already do to support children and young people to learn about mental wellbeing through Curriculum for Excellence. Stuart McWhelan. Uh, thank the First Minister for that reply. And as the First Minister will know, the exam season is now upon us. And can I ask the First Minister uh, if she shares my welcome of Sam H's excellent uh, Testing Times campaign, 
as she will be aware, that Sam H has produced a range of tips for young people on how to prepare for exams and also uh, how, to, how they manage the anxieties that they can actually bring. Does the First Minister agree with me that any young person who, doesn't, sorry, who does feel worried or under pressure should not suffer in silence and should not be afraid to seek support? First Minister. Well, can I thank Stuart Millen, McMillan for raising this? I, I really do welcome the Sam H Testing Times campaign, uh, which, of course, they've launched to coincide with the start of the exams. Uh, sitting school exams is something of a distant memory for me now, but I, as I'm sure all people in the chamber do, I, I still remember uh, the sense of stress and anxiety that was associated with that. Uh, and I think it's really important that we do recognise the impact that anxiety about schoolwork and exams can have on young people's mental health. So I wholeheartedly agree with Stuart McMillan that it's really important for young people facing exams to be able to discuss their emotional well-being openly. If they're concerned or upset, they should speak with uh, teachers, with parents, carers uh, or peers. All schools should help young people to develop resilience and personal coping skills and should have measures in place to support young people. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Sam H for the advice that they have made available and and again, as I've done already this, uh, this morning, take the opportunity to wish pupils who are completing assignments or taking exams the very best of luck over the next few weeks. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Neurodevelopmental disorders are a very significant component of the mental health issues in our schools. Groups re representing children with dyslexia, ADHD, autism and others regularly call for NDDs to be a mandatory component of initial teacher education and ongoing CPD. So can the First Minister outline how her government will ensure that all teachers are trained in teaching children with neurodevelopmental disorders? And I'd like to remind the Chamber of my own diagnosis. First Minister. Well, I think this is a really important issue. Um, Neurodevelopmental uh, conditions, of course, are an important part of what we are uh, discussing in mental health, and the issue of teacher training is also extremely important. The uh, Deputy First Minister is uh, advising me that the providers of initial teacher education were at the recent summit on autism uh, that uh, was held and uh, that this is very much part of initial teacher education. But I'm sure the Education Secretary would be very happy to discuss with the member whether there are further steps that could be taken to embed that even more firmly. And John Scott. Well, thank you, President. And Mr officer. Scott, could you just lift your microphone? Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. A particular concern is mental health issues in rural areas uh, of young people, uh, can she give, what further help can she give uh, to this specific problem in rural Scotland, which is blighting rural Scotland at this time? First question. That is a very important issue. Um, access to services generally is often more challenging in rural areas for obvious reasons, and that can be particularly the case with access to mental health services. It's important uh, that services uh, are available on an equitable basis. And uh, when we're talking, for example, about counsellors in secondary schools, it's important that there is uh, proper provision in every part of the country. Uh, NHS 24, of course, some of the online services uh, that and digital services that they make available, uh, I think are specifically helpful uh, for people in rural areas who perhaps find it more difficult to access physical services. Uh, but I want to give an assurance that access to services for those in rural areas is a core part of the planning that the National Health Service does and other agencies do uh, generally in terms of making sure that there is that equity of access. And question number six, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister what measures the Scottish Government will put in place to reverse the reported decline in subject choice in secondary schools. First Minister. The purpose of the curriculum is to provide young people with the skills, knowledge and experiences that will prepare them for their life beyond school and provide them with the best possible opportunities to fulfil their potential. As I've uh, already said uh, in the Chamber today, our focus must be on the whole school experience, on the range of qualifications achieved on leaving school and on the destinations of young people once they uh, leave school. And we will continue to ensure that that is the case. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the First Minister for that response? However, does she recognise that the biggest issue that is concerning parents and pupils in this whole issue is about the growing inequity in subject choice? Can I ask the First Minister, what is her answer to parents who are very concerned that their young people are receiving only a choice of six subjects in S4, while in other schools it is seven or eight what is her answer to that? Because many of them feel that their youngsters are being disadvantaged when it comes to college and university application. First Minister. Well, I, take, I take these issues seriously. Um, as said earlier on, we will pay close attention to uh, the Reform Scotland report. We will pay close attention to the review 
that the Education Committee is, is doing. But I repeat some of the points I made earlier on. It is important, and I hope, I hope that everybody in the Chamber accepts this. It is not simply the qualifications that young people do in S4 that count. It's the qualifications they do across the three years. Um, and what I would say to a parent uh, in response to uh, Liz Smith's question is that the evidence says more young people are going to university, including more young people from our deprived communities. So the evidence suggests, uh, contrary to the assertion uh, that young people, particularly in deprived communities, are somehow being disadvantaged, we see the attainment gap closing, which is, I think, the reverse of the concern that Liz Smith is raising. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you. Presiding, presiding officer, the truth is that pupils in Scotland now study a broader curriculum for longer. And when they do go on to choose their subjects, I did used to teach it, they study those subjects in far greater detail than under standard grade. Progression and depth are the principles of Curriculum for Excellence, a system the Tories used to support. Does the First Minister think that Liz Smith is willfully ignoring these facts, or has she just not done her homework? First Minister. First Minister. I think, I think all of these issues should be taken seriously. I think we should uh, listen to all views on these. But contrary to what some people in the Tory and Labour benches seem to think, I think we should particularly listen to the views of a teacher, uh, which Jenny Gilruth uh, was before she was in this, in this parliament. The evidence, the evidence says that more young people are leaving school with qualifications more young people are leaving school with five hires or more, and more young people are going into positive destinations, including university. Those are the outcome facts that I haven't heard any member of the opposition uh, manage to explain how that actually uh, aligns with the analysis they're putting forward. So we will continue to do the hard work necessary to ensure that we continue to see improvements in education. And Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Unlike Liz Smith or Jenny Gilruth, I wasn't a teacher, but I was a pupil not that long ago. Is the First Minister concerned that the government's own education agency refuses to acknowledge what a number of studies have now shown, that the number of subjects on offer to young people, particularly at higher level, has direct correspondence with the level of deprivation in their community? First Minister. Of course we will pay attention to all of those views that I'd expressed, but again, I point out the fact that if... if all of these things were creating the disadvantage uh, that Ross Greer and others are suggesting. We wouldn't have a situation that the attainment gap in access to university right now is at an all-time low. The numbers from deprived communities going into university uh, is at a high. So the evidence suggests uh, that far from pupils from deprived communities being held back, they are doing better than they've ever done before. Uh, and that is the progress we need to concentrate on making sure continues. And Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much. Can I suggest... Order, please. Let's listen to the question. Pay attention, please. <laughs> Joanne Lamont. Thank you. It wouldn't have happened back in the day, I can tell you that. I may not be a teacher now. I am, I'm not longer a, a parent of young children. I suggest the First Minister listens to teachers, to parents, and to the evidence from the experts that are telling us Currently, the system is more unequal than it was before and that they are disturbed that the evidence is suggesting that the poorest, most disadvantaged young people in our communities are more disadvantaged than they were before. I urge her to look to the evidence and then address that question. First Minister. Order, please. Order. That's enough. We will. First Minister. We'll listen to views and evidence from wherever it comes. But, but what I tell... I say this in all seriousness to Joanne Lambert. What I will not ignore and what nobody should ignore are the results of our education system. And the fact of the matter is we now have a record number of school leavers in higher education. Uh, school leavers from the most deprived uh, areas in higher education are up eight percentage points since a decade ago. 
Um, and overall, uh, the numbers in university from deprived areas is at a record high. So the evidence does not bear out the fact that the attainment, the inequality gap is growing. On the contrary, all of the evidence shows that that gap is narrowing. And everything we do in government, everything we do in our education system will be designed to ensure that that gap continues to narrow because that is what all of us should be focused on. Thank you very much. And that concludes the First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Bill Kidd on International Workers Memorial Day 2019. Before we do, we're going to have a short suspension to allow members, ministers and the public gallery to, uh, or members of the public to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>